So the last talk of the day is by Professor Christine Cheng uh, from the um, University of British Columbia. So Christine, it's all yours, go for it. Okay, thanks Alejandro. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, so I just wanna start off by thanking uh, the organizers of the workshop, really enjoying all the talks and have learned uh, so much uh, from them. Uh, so before we get started, I just wanted to um, point you to the relevant papers uh, that are related to the talk today. And particularly, I want to acknowledge the work of my co-authors, um, my uh, colleague Vincent Wong, as well as our postdoc, um, Shahab Barami, who is really the main driver behind uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and so together, the three of us, we've been kind of working on various large scale optimization problems in the power system by using tools from machine learning. And today my talk is related to using deep reinforcement learning for a demand response algorithm uh, in, in the distribution network. So this application setting is quite similar uh, to Lena's talk this morning, but I think as you'll see, our focus and consequently the problem formulation are quite different. Um, at the same time, Lena and to some extent Scott did a really great job to motivate the benefits um, as well as the major challenges of demand response. So uh, I still want to kind of briefly iterate uh, some main points and particularly emphasize uh, the ones that are really relevant to uh, my, my work here. Um, so to, to set the context first, uh, traditionally electricity is you know, mostly generated by large scale uh, power plants that are located far away from load centers. And this power is transmitted over a high voltage transmission system uh, and then step down closer to the load centers. Um, and so in this diagram, the bulk majority of what you see is uh, what's referred to as the distribution system. And so in this distribution system, there are um, lots of uh, households and within the households, there are lots of loads, uh, lights, oven, washing machine, computers, et cetera, right? Um, and traditionally the loads are uh, basically passive and they just kind of consume any amount of power that they want whenever they want. Um, and that is uh, really the, the sort of the archetype, right? That the supply, the electricity supply follows the demand for the electricity. And this really, again, reflects our expectation for high levels of power availability and quality uh, when it comes to our electricity. And as we all know, there is global efforts at the moment and, and uh, there should be <laughs> towards decarbonization in an effort to counter or at least halt the effect of greenhouse gas emissions on global warming. So for example, in Canada and really dozens of other countries, uh, we have a, a goal of reaching net zero emission by 2050. And this is across all economic sectors and not just uh, electric uh, utilities. Um, and for, you, for the electricity industry in particular, um, one thing that, that's obvious is that we want to reduce fossil fuel based generation. Um, and then this, of course, causes uh, a reduced capacity for generation, right? So we no longer have as much um, megawatts coming out. Uh, and so the kind of the, the consequence of that is that we'd like to add more renewable energy to the system. Um, and as an example, I'm going to uh, use the example of California. Um, and I think they have a goal for zero carbon electricity uh, by 2045 or 2050. <laughs> and just on Scott's comments earlier about California's reliance on other states in the US, I think I just kind of want to uh, stand up for Canada a little bit <laughs> right now and say that one of those states is actually um, a province in Canada, which is uh, where I am, British Columbia. Um, and I don't know how much of California's imports are coming from British Columbia, but I'm pretty sure uh, the vast majority, I'm thinking 80, 60, 80% of British Columbia's exports uh, go to California. 
and, and we're lucky in that we have a lot of uh, hydro up north, and so we, we are able to, to sell that power. Okay, so, so, so we have all these lofty goals and, and we wanna add lots of renewables, right? Um, so are we, are we done? Uh, ostensibly not, uh, but at, uh, also at the risk of seeming, you know, very unoriginal by now, uh, I will again sort of talk about this, this duck plot. Um, and, and like Scott mentioned and, and Lena as well, that this, this is a plot of net load. So the load minus renewable, and you know, we, we've talked about kind of the, the larger and faster changes, which requires great, greater ramping capabilities. Um, we've mentioned that there's kind of this belly of the duck, uh, which causes potential overgeneration. Um, but I always felt like the kind of uh, most stark observation to me is this peak demand, right? So we're adding all of this um, renewable generation. But as it turns out, we still need to serve as a whole to the system this maximum demand from the system, which really means that we can't actually quite remove any um, non-renewable capacity from, from the system and still be able to serve that peak. Right? So that's a bit silly. We're, we're investing lots of dollars uh, and effort into solar and wind, but still we, we need the conventional just as much, right, as, as before. Um, and the obvious solution here is, you know, battery storage, which means, you, you know, you're, you're going to store the, the or some, some other sort of storage. Uh, you're going to store the, the generation from midday from solar and use it later uh, when this uh, evening peak occurs. Uh, and along the same lines, demand response is, is a very similar idea, right? So instead of shifting generation, uh, we're going to shift load in time. So that's in a, in a nutshell kind of um, what demand response is, right? Shifting load in time. Um, I think Lena mentioned that uh, residential loads account for 38% of total electricity usage in the U.S., and I don't know, coincidentally, 38% of total energy used by Canadian households uh, is from electricity, is, is in the form of electricity. And so that is all to say that there is quite a lot of inherent flexibility in residential loads. And so the, the ability to shift these loads in time would actually have a significant impact to uh, reduce that peak. And, and that's really uh, going to help us reduce the amount of uh, conventional generation in the system. Okay, so the general idea in residential demand response is to basically incentivize customers to shift demand from the peak times to the off peak times, right? Um, and in the limit, if uh, the, in, in the limit of demand response, we would essentially have demand follow supply. Uh, instead of the other the other way around, which is what we're used to, uh, and this leads to kind of overall cost savings for the electricity customer, as well as for the utility, we get better generation load balance over time. So it's really a, you know a win-win situation. So going back to to the household loads that um, I've mentioned earlier. Um, so let's let's think about what's in there a little bit more carefully. So um, we're going to divide these these loads into two categories. The first is uncontrollable loads. Um, so computers, refrigerators, stoves. I think these generally are considered inflexible. Um, and and controllable loads. Um, and so these are air conditioning. Um, heating, so either space heating or water heating, uh, washing machines, dryer, um, you know, electric vehicles, battery storage. So these are types of loads that are, are typically considered to be um, controllable or flexible uh, and can be scheduled in time. And in a typical demand response program, uh, basically the households, so these, these stars everywhere now, send information to some 
um, load aggregator or some kind of centralized entity um, that about their minimum load, so their, their uncontrollable load, um, must serve load. Uh, the desired load that they would like to uh, be able to use, uh, the portion of that desired load that, that is controllable, right? so, so what they deem to be flexible, um, and this sort of information all goes to this central entity and then this entity, the load aggregator, then you know, does some kind of algorithm and figures out how best um, to optimize the system but still serve uh, the purpose of the utility um, and send, sends these instructions back to the households um, to schedule the flexible loads that they have. Right, so, so in this kind of framework or this kind of um, architecture, uh, an immediate kind of design or tuning knob is really, you know, this idea of a, the balance of automation versus discomfort. Um, so on one very extreme end in, in a Canadian example, again in Toronto, um, up until I think the end of last year, there was this program called the Peak Shaper Program and it essentially allowed system operators to automatically control hot water heaters and air conditioning during peak demand. Um, so they would, they, it, some, uh, some users would just sign up for that and um, they, they would just simply be uh, giving up complete control to the utility. And then on the other hand, uh, apparently this program or, or yeah, you know, that the actual control part of it was really only activated a handful of times at, you know, the very hottest times of the year. And so in the limit of the other extreme, uh, you know, customers just do whatever they like. And uh, so the other extreme is that there is no demand response program per se, but the customers are quite comfortable, right? They're happy with um, their, their conditions right? or their environment. Um, another consideration I think uh, that's perhaps been uh, underemphasized uh, so far in the previous talks is um, the effect of the, the network. Um, so in the load scheduling problem, and really I, I would say any problem in power systems, the network is a very uh, important consideration because it constrains the flow of electricity right, to particular routes. There's not in general, a pairwise connection between any two nodes. Um, and on top of this, in order to maintain the high power availability and quality that we're also used to, um, the electric utility needs to make sure that certain limits are not violated, operational limits. Um, so for example, if loads are drawing too much current, um, then equipment rated for a certain uh, maximum current may be damaged. Um, and then this may lead to um, you know, loss of service for, for certain loads. Also, some loads only operate uh, or, or operate most efficiently within a certain band of voltages. Um, and so uh, really that all, all I'm trying to say is that the system operating point must somehow respect these limits that are set up by the network as well as just operating limits. So then another challenge of this load scheduling problem is to make sure that the load control action actually leads to a feasible power flow solution and satisfies operational constraints. Um, additionally, the load aggregator, so if you're thinking about this sort of architecture where the load aggregator is making decisions on behalf of the electricity customers, um, the load aggregator may need some potentially private information in or, um, so, for, so for example, um, in order to ensure compliance, so for, you know, um, the personal discomfort of the user or the customers would be nice to know by this load aggregator, because you could imagine a situation if the load aggregator is, you know, doesn't understand what the customer considers to be uncomfortable, then you know, the, they, they issue some kind of uh, control action, but then the customer can simply you know, opt out in, in the language of Lena's talk, right? That, that they just do whatever they like. They just change the, the settings of 
their thermostat, for example. So, so that might be something important to know. Um, at the same time, there's uncertainty in this general structure, right? We're, uh, we don't have perfect forecasts of what the load is gonna look like for every single person in, in our distribution network. And um, the electricity price, if you're coming from kind of a real-time pricing uh, scheme, that's also uh, something that varies over time. Right, so these are kind of factors that um, uh, affect um, or, or, or make this load scheduling problem quite challenging. Uh, Um, so given, given these challenges, um, unsurprisingly, and, and I think this in, in this room, um, we're all aware that there are many, many papers on demand response. Um, so in this slide, I'm just gonna focus on the works that have uh, looked at, uh, that, that deal with uncertainty in some sense. Um, and so we can kind of divide this into, into three, roughly three categories. And the first pertains to uh, offline algorithms for demand response programs, uh, basically designing day ahead electricity markets using you know, bidding mechanisms, forecasting techniques, and, and other, other techniques. Um, the second line of work is, are, are kind of online based or online, but model based algorithms using various optimization techniques. Um, and in these, in these two, um, categories. So they're basically both model-based and, and they um, require models. So it's on, uh, models of the uncertainty is, is what I'm referring to here. Uncertainty models or models for uncertain parameters in the system um, in order to make either make predictions or to be able to incorporate that model into the, the problem formulation. Um, but in, in, in practice, this is not necessarily always available, um, but also um, there are, again, privacy issues where the customer may not be comfortable to share um, certain uh, information that, that they consider to be um, their own or, or private. And so this really motivates the use of so-called model-free methods, and uh, in particular, learning-based algorithms and in these methods, basically the idea is to sample the environment instead of relying on a predefined model. So we're, we're gonna learn from the environment and our experience exploring that environment. And um, in, in this kind of um, scheme or, or, or umbrella of techniques, the large number of uh, states and actions then motivate the use of deep neural networks uh, in conjunction with, uh, for example, reinforcement learning techniques. Okay, so this is kind of uh, an overview of, of existing work. Um, but at the same time, these methods, um, like I said, uh, because the, the operational constraints are quite important to us, these techniques actually may not yield feasible power flow solutions, meaning that the, the load action uh, schedules may actually violate certain operational constraints. Um, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and um, so, so in, I think I, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, so, so our approach at a glance, um, we are basically going to formulate the demand response problem as a Markov decision process. We're going to use reinforcement learning to directly learn the optimal strategy by exploring our environment and, and from experience. And so there's no need to model the uncertainty in, for example, electricity price or low demand or user discomfort in an explicit manner, right, with an explicit model. Um, and due to kind of the large action and state space, uh, given that we have so many um, if you can imagine kind of many, many controllable loads in a particular network that are being considered, um, the value function becomes quite difficult to evaluate or to estimate, approximate. Um, so we look to deep reinforcement learning to uh, basically use um, deep neural networks to approximate the value function. 
Uh, on top of that, we are taking a federated learning approach to update the neural network parameters using only local information from each user so that the update is done uh, without revealing private information from individual households. And again, this may include uh, you know, their must run load um, or must serve load, their desired load values and um, the discomfort that they experience. Um, so the end result uh, after this process or, or these two components in our approach, um, it may be that the load action or load control action may not actually um, uh, satisfy a feasible uh, power flow solution or, or satisfy all the operational constraints. So we're going to use uh, semi-definite programming to project this load control action that we get from the learning process onto a feasible power flow space. And so that the end result after these sort of three components is that we do have a um, load action for that, that satisfies all of the constraints, operational constraints. All right, so let's, let's just take a look at uh, kind of the, the parts of, of these uh, things that I'm talking about. So um, first to formulate the demand response pro problem as um, an MDP. So we have uh, a state, an action and cost or the reward. Okay, so uh, in each time slot, um, the states that we consider are the uncontrollable base load, uh, which is superscript B, uh, the minimum and the desired controllable loads, superscript C. Um, and also the state includes the electricity price. Uh, the action in each time slot of our demand response um, algorithm is the load set point, so the controllable load set point. And in particular, at least this controllable load set point should be between um, the uh, base load value, or rather the, the minimum controllable load value here and the desired, right? So that's at least, we, we should have that. Um, and the, uh, the cost is basically the combination of the bill payment to each uh, user or, or from each user rather, and the discomfort that the user feels, right? Um, so again, uh, going back to this idea of uncertainty, we basically consider uncertainty or, or consider the, the light bulb um, outlines or variables as um, things attached uh, to uncertainty in our problem. So the, the uh, states of, um, of the problem and as well as the discomfort cost, which is uh, uncertain uh, because individual users have different um, levels of tolerance. Okay. And so our goal is to essentially formulate this um, Markov decision process um, in order to find the policy that minimizes the expected discounted cost um, following a particular policy in the upcoming time slots, uh, starting in a, in a particular state. So that's kind of, you know, at the high level, uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. And again, we have these uncertainties in uh, the different variables um, that we don't have an explicit model for. Okay. So let's just, you know, imagine that we, we solved it. And we came up with a solution or, or we came up with a policy um, in order to, to implement the co load control action. Okay, so uh, we, we came up with this policy pi and the policy uh, specifies the probability of choosing an action in some state S, right? Um, and we can sample this probability distribution to get the actual load control action. Okay, so, um, you know, in, in an ideal setting or in a naive setting, great. Um, but however, um, again, as I mentioned before, the load control action may not actually yield a feasible power flow solution that satisfies all operational limits. And, and um, we know that, you know, the idea of safe, safe exploration or um, 
you know, satisfying and all of these operational constraints is important in a distribution network. So a natural way, oops, so a natural way of uh, incorporating um, safety is by formulating the MDP as a constrained MDP, right? So here you basically have the original reward function, and then you're going to add some weighted version of uh, the constraints, right? Um, and so in, in practice, there's this Lagrange multiplier that you put in front of the constraints and you wanna keep a balance and that, that helps you balance the, the, the importance of the actual cost, bill payment and discomfort uh, versus the constraint violations, right? So in practice, we, we need to tune this Lagrange multiplier uh, so that it's, it's not too large to excessively punish the penalty or punish the, the um, uh, not satisfying the operational constraint. Um, and, and at the same time, it's not so small that it, it you know, does not consider um, the, the um, violation of the, the penalty, right? So tuning really requires some, I, I think, uh, or trial and error in practice. And, and there are ways to avoid um, these, these types of efforts. Um, nevertheless, I think the types of constraints that we are dealing with, and in particular, we're dealing with power flow constraints, for example, um, they're like quite difficult to really incorporate into um, sort of a constrained MDP type of setting. Um, so our approach is really to just decouple um, this problem. So, so we take a quite a simple approach, I would say, that guarantees safety and exploration. And, and this is to decouple our problem into two parts. The first part is to solve the MDP, but with only box constraints for the controllable load. Okay, so this is easy to, to implement in, in our uh, deep neural network. Um, and so that's all, is, is, so, so we're gonna come up with some other policy, right? This pi tilde instead of pi um, that comes up with an action uh, a, a load schedule that satisfies the uh, upper and lower limits of what the controllable load can be. And then we're gonna take that value, right? And, and it may not satisfy the uh, power flow constraints. Um, if it does, great. Um, but if it doesn't, the second part of uh, the star, our algorithm basically projects that um, potentially infeasible action into the space of feasible power flow solutions satisfying the operational constraints, All right? So then this, this action can then be um, broadcast to each household and that's, that's the action that they should take in order to um, get the best sort of system level reward, right? Um, so the, the projection problem, so I'm gonna talk about the projection problem first. Um, it's essentially a, an OPF, an optimal power flow problem in disguise. Um, so the, the objective here is to minimize the distance between the potentially non-feasible load demand, which is in red, um, to one that is inside the feasible space, which is the green here. And the constraints include uh, nodal power balance, voltage limits, line flow limits, substation limits, you know, whatever limits you, you want to impose here. Um, and in particular, there's this rank one constraint, which is quite well known on the outer product of the voltage vector, uh, so this W. And um, again, it's quite well known that this problem is non-convex, and so we apply the semi-definite um, uh, relaxation to turn this problem uh, into a convex problem and solve it efficiently. Um, yeah, and then the, the cost um, that we're feeding back to the MDP is essentially the um, feasible, the, 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 the action that is in green, okay? Um, right, okay. So um, to recap a little bit, to, to just <laughs> collect our, our thoughts a little bit, um, we have essentially you know, addressed kind of the problem of um, determining a feasible action, right? So we, we formulated the um, 
uh, MVP in order to solve the demand response uh, problem uh, without explicitly modeling the uncertainty in electricity price, uh, low demand and user discomfort. Um, and in the case that this action, um, lo load control action at the output is infeasible, we um, use semi-definite programming to project that potentially infeasible load action into um, the, the feasible power flow space. Right, but um, again, you know, thinking about so many nodes and appliances in a distribution network, we still need to have kind of the deep part of the deep reinforcement learning algorithm to gradually update the value function and the policy without, uh, again, knowing the transition probabilities between uh, the states for, you know, for our large state space. Um, so for that, we use uh, kind of this actor critic based reinforcement learning framework. And we basically determine, use this framework to determine the optimal neural network parameters or weights in these uh, neural networks. And here there are two neural networks because it's an actor critic um, kind of framework. And we have a policy structure on the right hand side. Uh, and this is the actor that selects the actions. Uh, and then once it selects the actions, then uh, the left-hand side, the, the so-called critic, basically uh, criticizes <laughs> the actions that are made by the actor. And so together, um, they, they are able to, uh, this, this framework um, is able to converge to the optimal neural network weights uh, quite quickly. So in practice, you know, the, 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 these neural networks would essentially be maintained and tuned and updated by the load aggregator, right? Who's collecting all of this information from all the households. Again, so however, um, the, the customer uh, may not feel comfortable to share kind of their potentially private information, right? So in particular, their states, right? So again, their must run demand, um, their flex the, the amount of flexibility that they have. They, they may feel that that is, you know, indeed a, um, a private kind of information that they don't want other people to know. Um, and so, so the, the idea then that we, we or, or the, the approach that we take or the central idea behind the approach that we take is to hide the private information from the load aggregator. Okay, and so how do we do this? We, we, uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but, but essentially the, the key here is to note that we're using local training, right? So training is done at individual households, but the model that results is a global model. Okay, so everybody has the same neural network at the end of the day. Um, and that's actually key in, in kind of this so-called uh, federated learning architecture. Okay, so I think the way that we hid this potential private, potentially private information is actually um, quite clever and, and simple and intuitive. Um, so if you, you, if you, you know, look at this, this um, neural network and basically the inputs are the states, right? So the electricity price and the states from individual households. And so let's let's just look at one of them, one of, one of the households, right? So what, in in one of the households, we have three states, and these were uh, you know base load, minimum controllable load, and their desired load. Okay, so again, you know the customer may not feel comfortable sharing individual um, values, right, of of this um, uh, of, of these this information to the load aggregator or to other households. Right? So the idea here is that we're going to aggregate this input to one node of the um, neural network from one household. So this is a weighted sum, essentially. Right? So we aggregate each household's input into the neural network, into one value. And this essentially just hides the individual states. Okay? And, and this is simple. It's, it's just a weighted sum. Right? So the input weighted by the neural network uh, weights. Okay, and then we, we kind of stack these up um, uh, for, for each of the nodes in the first hidden layer of the neural network. 
And then you can consider that um, we can aggregate the inputs to one node of the hidden, um, the hidden layer of the neural network uh, from all households except one, right? So again, this is a weighted sum. It's very easy to, to um, compute. And we can stack up that for each of the, the nodes in that first hidden layer, right? So basically what, what is happening or what is going to happen is that the household calculates its own individual aggregate, right? And, and that's the value that it sends to the load aggregator. So immediately the load aggregator has no idea or, or it is at least hidden from the load aggregator individual values of the states, right? And then the load aggregator gets this aggregate value from every single household. And what it does is, is it's going to basically consolidate all of th these numbers and calculate the sum of the M minus one. So, so of all the households, except for the one um, that is being considered and passes it back to uh, that household. And that value becomes, so, so we basically have this, this bias node with an input one, but with a weight that is that aggregate value, right? So no individual household knows the individual states of any other household. In fact, they don't even know the aggregate uh, sum of states from uh, other households. Um, and so uh, what is going to happen now is the each individual household will update the um, neural network parameters based on its own information and this aggregate number that comes from the load aggregator. Uh, and then they'll, um, the, the, um, each household then passes or sends the neural network parameters that it gets to back to the load aggregator. And then there, the load aggregator uh, simply takes the average of all the um, parameters and broadcasts that back. And so the key again here is that um, there's a global model at the end, a global um, neural network that everybody has access to. But at the same time, uh, nobody or no individual household and not the aggregator, the load aggregator either, um, none of them have kind of the individual data of individual um, people in, in the network. Right, so we've been able to hide that information. Right, so um, again, to, to recap, um, so we, we've been able to use the actor critic uh, based reinforcement learning and take advantage of this federated learning architecture where the neural networks are trained um, across many decentralized uh, edge devices. And the load aggregators job is really just sending things around, right? It, it collects data and then it does some averaging and it passes it back or, or averaging or summing uh, and passes it back. Um, and from, from there, then we are uh, again, going back to that first part of this decoupled problem, um, the load action may not be feasible. And so we, we project it onto the feasible space by semi-definite semi programming. Right, uh, and just uh, to show some results here, we have um, uh, some performance evaluation with a 33 bus distribution feeder. Uh, so here there's 32 households and each of the households we assume um, have, uh, has uh, seven controllable loads and seven uncontrollable loads. And we're considering a 24 hour period. Uh, and in this particular um, case study, we're looking at a time of use type of um, pricing structure. And so the results, if you look at this um, diagram here, or this plot, uh, the peak demand uh, at the end of, um, so this is 30 days of, of training data, um, goes down by a third. So from about 90 to 60 uh, kilowatts in, in per time slot. Uh, and we can see that there is a shift in the demand. So because there the, the peak has been lowered, there's now going to be, uh, the desired load is gonna be higher in later time slots. Um, the other thing that we did was 
um, consider an upper limit of 30 kilowatts uh, injection at the substation from 1 a.m. to about 6 a.m. And so you can see that for um, this particular load profile that's in um, the green, the, uh, that's marked by the green line, it indeed um, respects that constraint. So, so that's where we do the projection and over time, the algorithm learns um, that it's not a good idea to, to do that. Um, to, 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 uh, or it, the algorithm learns that it's, it's good to, to stay under uh, the, um, uh, the constraint that, that we've uh, kind of artificially set. Um, and the expected cost of the controllable loads, uh, so looking at this diagram here, reduces from about 95 cents um, to 65 cents or so over 30 days. Uh, and we also compared it with other algorithms. So this is the same system. And here we're showing basically a plot over um, more, uh, you know, 150 days in this, in this case. Um, so we're seeing um, our, our algorithm, which is algorithm one, this decentralized federated learning algorithm uh, is the red line. And it converges to the same solution as the centralized version of this problem, right? So just without the federated learning part, um, but it, it takes a little bit longer um, to converge to that same solution. Uh, and we, we compared it to Q-learning and double Q-learning and found that it, um, the actor critic based method uh, converges uh, faster than either the Q-learning or the double Q-learning. Um, and we can see also that the expected daily cost, um, so you know, basically looking at the, the convergence, it, it pretty much um, goes to a constant or just slightly fluctuating value after 30 days. And this indicates that this, the training phase has completed at the 30 days or after 30 days. Uh, and we also um, looked at uh, larger test systems to demonstrate scalability. And so in this case, we're considering um, 330 bus test feeder and 1650 uh, bus 1,650 bus test feeder. Um, and in both these cases, uh, and, and we're also considering a real-time pricing in this case, which um, signifies kind of greater volatility or greater uncertainty in the price. And here we saw that um, the convergence is unsurprisingly, it takes longer because the system is larger and we have way more actions and way more states um, than the 33 bus test system. Um, but what's kind of uh, good to note is that, um, you know, this is an online algorithm and we can see that the expected daily cost already reduces by 10% in the first 30 days or so. Okay, so um, just as a summary of uh, the, our, uh, the algorithm here then, uh, where we've used uh, the actor critic method um, in order to achieve faster convergence. Uh, our algorithm, kind of the key part about this is that it preserves user private information by updating the, the um, neural network parameters or, or weights locally, right? So each um, household passes to the load aggregator their aggregate state value, right? So thereby just automatically hiding what their individual states look like. Um, the, the load aggregator then just simply you know, does some consolidation of this, these numbers and then sends back yet another, you know, an even more aggregate value to e each individual household. Um, and then each individual household then you know, is able to update the neural network parameters and pass those back up to the uh, load aggregator who then simply um, just takes the average of uh, the parameters and then broadcasts that back. Um, so again, the key here is that all of the edge nodes um, have the same um, neural networks that they're working with um, and, and they're not you know, sort of keeping different copies. Um, and then the semi-definite programming at the end helps us to project the potentially infeasible action onto 
the feasible power flow space uh, so that for sure the final control action, we can be sure that the, it respects the operational constraints. Right, and so just um, to conclude, we saw pretty good performance of our, our algorithm and an immediate extension that we see is uh, perhaps doing this same type of um, idea or applying the same type of idea for demand response, but considering also other uncertainty sources. Um, we also think that there are other pertinent applications in distribution networks that can benefit from kind of this decentralized implementation of uh, deep reinforcement learning that um, preserves these the, the private information from users. And these are things like electric vehicle charging and um, perhaps peer-to-peer -peer energy markets. All right, so thank you very much for uh, your time. Uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we have time for one question as we are running behind quite a bit. Um, so there is one question here about the challenges on uh, training uh, the RL model. I mean, uh, you know, it's well known that you need a lot of uh, uh, data to do this uh, training. So could you elaborate on that, the challenges you face and, and all these uh, things a little bit? Yeah, and so I guess the the, the results are, are um, as you saw, right, for a larger system, I mean, for a 33 bus system, it already took um, about 30 days for, so these are 15 minute intervals, 24 hours a day um, for 30 days. Um, and so for the larger systems, we found that indeed, you know, very data intensive. Um, so it, it took, uh, what, 100 days, three or four months uh, mm -hmm. worth of data to for, for the algorithm to converge um but i mean this is sort of long run right we, we imagine that we'll run the demand response um program or the algorithm for much longer than three or four months um and certainly for larger systems perhaps you know still yet to be seen kind of what values that we get there uh, a question that just came into the chat that i think is relevant did you have to use a high performance computing uh, to do this or you did it in a laptop laptop yeah it was okay. just a personal computer yeah. 